Hi and welcome to this session on imaging of pediatric congenital heart diseases. I am Dr. Major Vimal Raj. I am a consultant cardiothoracic radiologist heading the unit of cardiac imaging at Narayana Institute of Cardiac Sciences, a part of the Narayana Hridayalaya Hospital. In this session, I'm going to be discussing pediatric cardiac CT and MR looking at congenital heart disease. So my objectives are very clear. I'm just going to show you five cases, four cases in CT and one case in MRI. I want to show you a stepwise manner of assessing congenital heart disease on cross-sectional imaging, make you acquainted to common pathologies that one may come across and laying a foundation for deeper learning. So let's get started. Here is case number one. I'm going to let it run a couple of times and you can see what is the pathology and try and make a note of it. Essentially in our institute we tend to do two sets of run. The first run is ECG gated when we are looking at congenital heart diseases and the second run is a non-ECG gated study. So CT we are doing two runs. We are fortunate to have a very high end CT scanner which makes the radiation exposure very less and also the amount of contrast required is very minimal. The quality of images that we get are also excellent because of a high end CT scanner. So have a look at this case, what you're seeing here, what is your observation, what kind of congenital heart disease this is and what should be your differential diagnosis and how would you report this case. I hope you have managed to go through the case in quick succession here and you have made up some of your opinions and now let us go and look at the selective images and see what all pathologies were present in this CT scan as we discuss the case. So the first thing that I would do in terms of assessment of my uh, congenital heart disease is to first look at the location of the spleen and the location of the liver. As you can see in this scan, this is the liver here and this is the spleen. So that kind of makes it as a visceral situs solitus, so normal uh, visceral situs. The next thing I start looking at is the systemic venous drainage. So in this case, what you're seeing here is the SVC draining into the right atrium. And then similarly, we look for the IVC drainage, which you can see here is draining into the right atrium. So normal visceral situs and normal systemic venous return. The next thing I tend to look at is to look at the morphology of the ventricles. One of the things to look at, the easiest thing to look at is to recognize a left ventricle, you look at the interventricular septum. The surface of the interventricular septum is smooth towards the left ventricle while it is a bit irregular towards the right ventricle. And you can always see a moderator band coming out of the right ventricle. So we look at the arrangement of the ventricles when the left ventricle or morphological left ventricle is on the left side then this is called as a de-looping of ventricles. So we've seen so far situs solitus. We can also see that this is levocardia. The tip of the LV is pointing to the left side. So situs solitus, levocardia, normal systemic venous return. As part of the situs, it is also useful to look at the lung anatomy and making sure that the right trilobe lung is on the right side and the left bilobe lung is on the left side. The next step of assessing this would be to look at the pulmonary venous return. It is important to track each and every individual pulmonary veins so that it is draining into the left atrium. Here I have put up some of the images where you can see this is the right inferior pulmonary vein, this is the right superior pulmonary vein, this is the left inferior pulmonary vein and this is the left superior pulmonary vein which is draining into the left atrium. The next important step which comes in a assessment of any congenital heart disease is to look for the interatrial septum and the interventricular septum. 
And what you can see in this case is that there is a deficient interventricular septum or a VSD. No obvious ASD is seen. The other thing which comes is to look at the location of the VSD. VSDs when they are lower down are considered as muscular VSDs while VSDs which are higher up tend to be membranous or perimembranous. The other thing is to look at the relationship of the aorta with the VSD. So you can see here this is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle, this is the aorta taking off and you can see that the aorta is overriding the VSD. So the VSD is kind of in the middle where the aorta is getting its blood both from the right ventricle as well as from the left ventricle. This is another image uh, where you can see LV connecting to the aorta and this is the mitral valve across here where the mitral valve and the aortic valve have a common insertion point here which is termed as aortomitral continuity. When you see this then you are not worried about the other entity known as DORV or double outlet right ventricle. If you see that the aorta and mitral valve do not have this continuity then the aorta is most likely arising fully from the right ventricle. Another important feature with all congenital heart disease is to look at the pulmonary anatomy. And you can see in this case this is the main pulmonary artery this is the right pulmonary artery and this is the left pulmonary artery. What is clearly seen is that there is stenosis in the proximal to mid left pulmonary artery with dilatation distally. Also it's important to look this is the right ventricular outflow tract in two different views and you can see that there is narrowing below the valve or infundibular stenosis. So pulmonary infundibular stenosis as well as LPA stenosis is present in this case. Always uh, look for the measurements of the distal left pulmonary artery and the distal right pulmonary artery. You measure this and look at the measurement of the iota at the diaphragm. One more thing in this patient now you start looking at uh, the origin of the coronary arteries. So you can see here this is the iota which is giving rise to two different coronary arteries this one coronary artery seems to be coming anterior to the right ventricular outflow tract. This happens to go and settle in the interventricular groove. So this is a LAD. So LAD seems to be crossing anterior to the right ventricular outflow tract. Usually LAD should arise from somewhere here and take its course behind or posterior to the right ventricular outflow tract. Also look and make sure that there is no coarctation and the arch is normal. So this is a left aortic arch without any coarctation. In summary, this is a case of tetralogy of phallot. What you have seen is situs solitus levocardia. We've also seen pulmonary outflow tract obstruction or infundibular stenosis with LPA stenosis. It is important to mention McGoon's ratio, which is nothing but the sum of distal LPA with distal RPA divided by the dimension of the iota at diaphragm. So we make the RPA plus LPA divided by iota at the diaphragm. A value which is more than 1.6 or 1.7 is good and surgical uh, options can be given to the patient. If it is smaller than that, that means we have to do some two-stage procedures or palliative surgery in these patients. VSD with overriding of iota is also seen in this case and we also saw right ventricular hypertrophy. One important thing with all tetralogy of fallot is to look at the anatomy of the coronaries and in this case we saw major coronary crossing of RVOT. This is an important information to be given to the surgeon. Also, we looked at the iota. We are looking for collaterals which are supplying the lungs. These are also something we need to be aware of to make sure that we are not missing any significant pathology. So these are all the important points that you should be mentioning in your report when it comes to tetralogy of phallot.
Now let us look at case number two. I'm going to let it run for a couple of times so you get acquainted to what you're looking at and what is the pathology that we are focusing on. Again, uh, standard technique for us is to do one run ECG gated and one run non-ECG gated so we can see the coronary arteries very clearly. I'm going to let this scan run one more time so you can have a clear approach. Remember, the way we approach these cases, we look for the abdominal situs, we look for the systemic venous return, we look for the ventricular relationship, then we look for the pulmonary venous connection, then we look at the iota, also look at the pulmonary arteries and the coronary arteries before we make up our mind. So, now let's look at the summary images of this case. The liver is on the right side, spleen is on the left side, so this is normal situs. The systemic venous return, the IVC is seen here and this is the SVC seen here. It's on the right side which is normal and you can see that this is the right ventricle which is hypertrophied here. This is the left ventricle, this is the moderator band of the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. This is levocardia, normal visceral situs. The next thing which we start looking at are the pulmonary veins. This is the right superior pulmonary vein. You can see it across here and this is the right inferior pulmonary vein. You can see the left inferior pulmonary vein also and the left superior pulmonary vein also here. When you start to look for its drainage, you start to see that this is the kind of channel which is formed rather than joining into a atrial cavity this channel seems to be going up here and then if you follow that that channel comes across and drains into the right SVC so this channel is called as an ascending vertical vein it seems to be draining into the brachiocephalic vein and then into the right SVC as a completion we look at the right ventricular outflow tract nothing there we are looking at this where the interventricular septum is intact but the interatrial septum has got a large defect suggestive of an ASD. We've looked at the iota. The arch looks a little small but there is no clear coarctation which we can see and this is pulmonary artery bifurcation. So in summary this is a case of total anomalous pulmonary venous connection where you could see that all the pulmonary veins got together behind the heart formed a channel called as the left ascending vertical vein drained into the brachiocephalic vein and then into the right SVC. So this is a supracardiac type of TAPVC. Remember every time you see a TAPVC look for any focal areas of obstruction. If you see an obstruction in the passage of these veins then it can become a surgical emergency and the patient may need immediate surgery. In our local database this is a study which we had conducted some time back it was very clear that the supracardiac TAPVC is the most common variety almost 50 percent of cases are like that which is followed by cardiac TAPVC and the veins drain into the coronary sinus commonly. Mixed type of TAPVC is the third most common type of TAPVC that you may come across. Let us look at case number three. Again, I'm making it run a couple of times so you can have a look at the images and make up your mind with regards to what you're seeing. Same pattern should be followed. You look at the visceral situs. You look whether it's levocardia, dextrocardia or mesocardia. You look for systemic venous return, then you look for pulmonary venous return, then we look at the pulmonary arteries, we look at the iota, the ASDs and the VSDs. So it's a standard pattern but uh, it is very difficult for uh, to you to see and learn these images in such short time but I'm just trying to show you a snippet of what congenital heart disease looks like on a CT and I'm sure you will be able to pick up most of these abnormalities 
if you are given plenty of time and with the knowledge of what I've just told you. So let me run this the last time and once this finishes we will have a look at the focused images of this patient. Okay, so we are seeing here again you look at the images here you're seeing a situs solitus the liver the spleen on the right normal location this is the IVC and you can see it's draining into the right atrium now in this case the SVC when you're trying to look you can see one small vessel here and you're looking at another small vessel here so this is a example of bilateral SVCs in this patient then further down you can again see, as I said, the interventricular septum is smooth on the LV side and it has got the moderator band on the right side. So this is levocardia with normal ventricular relationship. Next stage, as I said, would have been pulmonary venous return, which we have checked and it's normal. Now we are looking at interatrial septum and interventricular septum and you can see that there is a VSD very similar to what we had seen and you can see the channel which is coming out of the heart here is overriding this VSD. Now when we interrogate this channel a bit further or try to look for pulmonary arteries what you are seeing is that this is a right-sided aortic arch in this patient and from there itself you're seeing this coming off. This is the right pulmonary artery and this is the left pulmonary artery. So there seems to be a common channel which is coming out of the heart which is clearly seen here a common channel coming out of the heart which is then dividing into two parts this continues as the aorta while this is again dividing into two different parts which is the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery i hope you are able to appreciate these things so this is a a uh, common truncus which is coming out of the heart continuing as aorta and then pulmonary artery. So this is a case of truncus arteriosus whereby just a single channel comes out of the heart. There are different classification systems and there are different types of truncus. We tend to follow the Collett and Edwards classification and this is a type 1 truncus which is the most common type, common trunk then it gives rise to the main pulmonary artery which divides into the right and left. In type 2 truncus there is almost a absent main pulmonary artery but the right and left come off from one common location while in type 3 they are coming on either side of the aorta and in type 4 you are looking at the pulmonary arteries coming out of the descending thoracic aorta. In the Van Prague system of classification, it basically A1 is similar to type 1, A2 is also similar to type 2, while there are these A3s and A4s which are important because in type A4, which is another pathology that we have seen quite often, is interruption of the aortic arch and then the ductus basically continuing as the descending aorta and then there is the pulmonary artery. So whenever you see a truncus arteriosus, please mention the type of truncus it is and then look for coronary anatomy, look for the main pulmonary artery whether it is present or whether it is absent. This will be useful in surgical planning of these patients. This is one unusual case where the truncus is present but there is a right aortic arch that also becomes important uh, information before surgery okay that brings us on to case number four again the same process uh, you guys spend a couple of minutes looking at these images to try and understand what pathology that you are seeing in this case uh, look for the abdominal situs look for the systemic venous return look for the pulmonary venous return, look at the pulmonary arteries, look at the aorta, look at the ASDs and VSDs. 
then you can make up your mind as to what the diagnosis is in this case so I'm gonna make it run a couple more times so this gives you ample amount of time to try and understand what you're looking at in normal practice you would report this case after looking at all different planes so axial sagittal and coronal so what you're seeing here is slightly uh, rapid fire testing or rapid fire reporting of complex congenital heart disease uh, but uh, this is a good way of learning to test yourself and see what you may be able to pick so this is running for the last time so if you've not made up your observations I hope you will be able to pick up the abnormality now in this case so we've looked and seen that the abdominal situs is normal the systemic venous return is also normal the pulmonary venous return is also normal so let's jump straight in to the pathology in this case and the pathology in this case is a coarctation of iota okay where you can see in different planes that there is coarctation of iota and you can see some systemic collaterals which are trying to bypass this whenever you are looking at a coarctation of the iota it is important for you to ensure you know the arch anatomy so this is a left aortic arch with a normal branching pattern so the brachiocephalic artery the left common carotid artery and the left subclavian artery next you have to mention a few things in terms of the coarctation whether the coarctation is focal or it is a long segment coarctation so you measure the length of coarctation and you report that also useful is to say how far is it from the left subclavian artery so if any intervention is planned it can be executed properly one thing which I have seen often is that some of these patients can have peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis so it is useful to look at the pulmonary arteries and make sure that there is no associated syndromes where there is peripheral pulmonary stenosis so in summary when you are looking at coarctation of iota you are looking at the type of arch you are looking at the branching pattern you have to look at the location and also give dimensions aortic valve whether it is bicuspid or tricuspid is also useful at this point I would draw your attention to this website called as the parameters.com uh, a lot of cardiologists use this but there is a version of cardiac MR also within it which is very very useful I would use this so that you could look at the Z scores for the aortic root and the aortic arch in MRI so we enter the height and weight of the patient we get the body surface area and then we mention the dimensions of aorta at multiple levels ascending aorta is important at the level of the brachiocephalic artery or proximal arch then the transverse arch in the in between the brachiocephalic and the common carotid and then the distal transverse arch which is between the common carotid and the subclavian artery which is followed by the isthmus and then the descending aorta and you get clear-cut Z scores so that you know how bad is the stenosis or how bad is the coarctation also if the coarctation is severe you may get a hypoplastic aortic arch so you need to know the Z score of these areas in the aorta that brings us on to the last case of the day and uh, this is a dynamic study that you can see across here you're able to see the heart beat uh, so this is a cardiac MR study that we are looking at and uh, I will again let this play for you to get used to what you're seeing here this is a cardiac MR study of a patient who has had some form of cardiac surgery for a congenital heart defect I will not tell you what the defect was or I will not tell you what surgery they had I just want you to have a look and see what you think about it cardiac MR for congenital heart disease is extremely useful and uh, can give us plenty of information both anatomical functional as well as morphology related to the heart of the patient we tend to do this as more of a troubleshooting tool because 
little children need anesthesia or even intubation if the examination is going to be low. So our first modality of choice for pre-op congenital heart disease assessment happens to be CT while post-op we tend to look at cardiac MR as the modality of choice for investigation. So this is a child you can see that there has been a sternotomy and we are looking at different pathologies. The same process applies here so we've seen that this is situs solitus where the liver is on the right side you can see that the descending aorta is on the right side so this is likely to be a right aortic arch the right ventricle is dilated compared to the left ventricle this is the right ventricular outflow tract again that looks dilated and this is confluent branch pulmonary arteries that we can see and this is the right aortic arch that you have seen now if uh, we dedicatedly look at two or three views of this patient so this is the right ventricular outflow tract view and what you can see here that the ventricular outflow tract is quite big or capacious and you are seeing what is free pulmonary regurgitation you can see blood going up and then you see this turbulence which is coming back up this is the LVOT view where you can see the aorta coming off and uh, this is where there was a surgical patch put in for a VSD repair and that seems to be intact in this case. So, RVOT dilatation, right ventricular dilatation and pulmonary regurgitation with an intact VSD patch. So, you guessed it correct, this patient has had a intracardiac repair or ICR for tetralogy of fallow. It is very, very crucial to know that cardiac MR is the gold standard in assessment of the ventricular volumes and function and we get very accurate right ventricular volumes in these patients and we can also quantify the degree of pulmonary regurgitation in saying that this is whether it is 30% or 40% or 55% so this will help the clinical team to decide whether this patient needs percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement now or whether they would need it at a later stage. So there are some guidelines which help us in deciding the appropriate timing for pulmonary valve replacement especially the percutaneous valve replacement and all these parameters can be derived from cardiac MR. Again it's important to look at the anatomy of the pulmonary arteries and make sure that there is no new pulmonary stenosis and also to make sure that the function of the ventricles is maintained without any compromise in these patients. To summarize, prior to performing any CT or MRI for congenital heart disease, it is very vital to know that what is the outcome or what is the data that is expected to come out of the scan and we need to tailor our examination to answer those specific questions. It is very important to get best quality images and it may often require mild sedation for children to get those good quality images otherwise diagnosis can be difficult. And every uh, congenital heart disease case has to be dealt with in a stepwise manner something called as a segmental approach a glimpse of which which I have told you today but you need to do a little bit more deeper dive into this to learn more about it. Cardiac MR is a good modality when you're looking at ventricular function or morphology. Anatomical details, uh, CT can give you that in much clarity. I hope you have learned uh, some new things and I hope this has given you some more interest in pursuing cardiac CT and MRI uh, I do happen to run a online virtual training session for clinicians who want to improve their cardiac knowledge in both CT and MRI called as the radiology masterclass or ACE radiology masterclass. Uh, if you are interested then please do uh, visit the uh, YouTube page of mine and uh, you will be able to find details there or just drop me an email and I will forward you the details. Currently, we are conducting adult uh, CT and cardiac MR sessions. 
the pediatric CT and uh, pediatric MR sessions will be uh, starting soon in the new year. Thank you again uh, for your patient listening and I look forward to comments and any questions from your end.